Church, he is holy and he deserves every heart, soul, mind, strength. He deserves all of our love and our attention on him alone. Amen. Amen. So let's draw near to him by turning again to the truth of his word. Two scriptural addresses again this morning. We're going to begin in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter two. And then we'll make our way to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 15, Ecclesiastes, page 656, if you're using one of those pew Bibles, and then Luke 15, page 1039, 1039. Grateful that you're continuing to join with us during this season of Lent. Um, We are purposely um, in this series and this study looking at Solomon and our Savior. And if you missed last week's teaching, remember, you can always download um, the Fellowship Church app. Uh, All the media is posted there. You can also uh, go to frchudsonville.org and you can find all the messages available there for you. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a privilege it is to have this opportunity and this time with you. We're often so busy in this world running around and and doing so many things, even now concerned about the fact that we somehow lost an hour during the night, and yet you are beyond all time, and you refuse to lose any of those who you so love. So find us now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Draw us into the truth of your word, and may it never simply be something that we hear and know, but may it be a story that we love and a life that we live in loving obedience back to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so there are these two kingdoms that are ongoingly vying for your heart and for my heart, there is the the kingdom of God whereby God is seated on his throne and he rules with strength and power and wisdom. And then there is also the kingdom of this world. I wonder which one you're pursuing this morning. What kingdom are you chasing after? Jesus spent some time in in the wilderness. He had fasted and prepared himself for this encounter with Satan. And then he went into this temptation time. Satan was trying to get Jesus to choose between. He was trying to get Jesus to decide, to to make a choice. What kingdom? Jesus, are you going to go after the kingdom of God Or can I tempt you to pursue and run after the the kingdom of this world? Well, you already know that the kingdom of this world is the one promoted by Satan. The kingdom of this world is, is selfish. The kingdom of this world is individualistic. It's focused on me, myself, and I. It is a kingdom where the person, where the individual does whatever they want, whatever you want, and it is so often based on feelings and emotions in the sensation of of the moment. And there's no regard for consequences. There's no regard for, for price. There's no worry about tomorrow or the reality that the kingdom of this world has only one destination, and that's separation from God and the never-ending consequences of hell. Of course, Jesus did not choose the kingdom of this world, but, but having been tempted in triplicate, Jesus was still all about the kingdom of his Father in heaven, the kingdom of God. Jesus celebrated his his father in heaven. He promoted his father's authority and power. He loved the word and the will and the way of God, the conscious movement of God in the lives of, of those he so loves. Instead of selfishness and dead ends, the kingdom of God is all about transformative 
relationships. It's about being known. It's about being loved. It's about being pursued by God. It's about knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord and living your life in loving obedience, knowing that the best part is yet to come. Amen, church? When we will one day see God face to face in all of his glory. So which one will you decide for? Uh, the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of God? Again, throughout this season of Lent, we are considering both kingdoms and, and, and we're considering them through, through the lens and the experience of, of Solomon in the Old Testament, in the book of Ecclesiastes, and, and we're also considering them through the lens of our Savior, whose name is, is Jesus the Christ, the one and only Son of God. Last week, we looked at Solomon and we looked at our Savior Jesus and, and, and what it means to have purported wisdom in this world, in the kingdom of this world, and what real wisdom looks like afforded to us uh, by God in, in terms of the kingdom of God. This week, we're going to look at, at another uh, component of, of both of these kingdoms, the idea of pursuing pleasure. Say that with me, pursuing pleasure. What does pleasure look like or the pursuit of it in the kingdom of this world? And then what does, what does our Savior Jesus have to say about pleasure and the kingdom of God? Let's look at Solomon's idea of pleasure first. Solomon is, is focused upon the, the kingdom of this world and the pleasure and, and opportunities it provides. I'm in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Beginning at verse one, listen to what Solomon has to say um, in regards to the pursuit of pleasure. He says, I, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with what? With pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, say that with me, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil, verse 11. Then I considered, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. What does Solomon have to say about the pursuit of pleasure in this, in this world, the kingdom of this world. Again, verse one, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Solomon is gonna chase after worldly pleasure in every single way. He's gonna pursue it in every single way because he also believes that there is only so much time, there are only so many days for us to exist, 
when we are committed to the kingdom of this world. Look down there at verse three. He says, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the, the few days of their life. And, and so this pursuit of pleasure, confined and, and limited by time, Solomon says, I'm going to do everything that I can do. All the fun and the games that I can chase after, I'm going to make the most of it. And in verse two, he says, I'm going to run after the pleasure that is laughter. You and I might not think much about laughter, but you, you might think about that which brings it forth, which would be entertainment. He's going to entertain himself, the pleasure of entertainment. Once upon a time, it, it was theater, and then theater became concerts and, and, and singing and, and instruments, and then there were, were movies and, and, the, and the, the cinema, and now today we still have such pleasure, we still have such entertainment, but it's right there in our hands, on a phone, a short video clip, a, a funny picture, your daily dose of internet, and we're, and we're sharing it and sending it back and forth with one another. There is the, the pursuit of pleasure that's found in entertainment. Verse two, the verdict, he says it's mad. It's mad. Next he says, how about a little wine? Verse three. And then not just a, a little wine, but, but he, he goes down there in, in verse three yet and, and it says how to lay hold on folly there, there are some Bible scholars who put together this, this idea of Solomon's pursuit of, of wine and, and his pursuit of, of wine and folly simultaneously. And it's the idea that he didn't just have a little bit. He didn't just have a lot, but he had too much. And he found himself completely inebriated and, and given over to this passed out purported pleasure. How about some wine? His desire for pleasure pushed him towards an impressive building campaign. Building what? Building a, a lifestyle for himself. Even Solomon wanted to live in a certain neighborhood. He wanted to look a certain way. He wanted to experience the, the, finest, thing of, the finest things of life. Again, look at verse six. He says, I, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of, of growing trees. Did you hear any word in, in, in those few verses that was repeated? Any guesses? I and also my self. Myself, 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 pursuing uh, worldly pleasure in, in the kingdom of this world, again, is often so selfish. It is so self-centered. It is so all about me. And this lifestyle that he was creating was, was all for himself. Still not satisfied, he added to his lifestyle. He says, I went out and and got for myself slaves, verse 7, and even had slaves born in, in his house. He had herds and flocks, verse 7. In fact, he had more herds and flocks than anybody before him. Silver and gold, the treasure of, of other kings and provinces. Again, more entertainment. He he, he got for himself singers, both men and, and women, verse 8. There's the concubines that are discussed in verse 8. In fact, Solomon had, had a thousand wives and concubines. He saw women as property and simply something pleasurable and not as women created in the image of God. He says in verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. He's honest. 
He says, you know what? As, as long as I continue to pursue pleasure, it, it, it had its moments of fun. As long as I continue to pursue pleasure, as long as I continue to, to add to it and, and, and to do more, and, and isn't that the way when you pursue worldly pleasure, the next hit has to be higher. It has to be stronger. It has to be more potent. It has to have greater experience than that which was experienced before. You see, when, when worldly pleasure is the most important thing, you're ultimately going to find that you're never really satisfied. And that is where Solomon finally lands in verse 11. Look down. His verdict of it all. All was vanity and striving after wind. And there was what church? Say it again. Nothing. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. And yet, and yet I, and yet we have to be honest. The, the temptation of Satan regarding the kingdom of this world and the pursuit of pleasure is so relentless. It is marketed so strongly every single day. It's marketed through our technology. It's marketed as we move about. But folks, do not deny how it is spiritually marketed and set in front of us by the deceiver who is Satan. So many of us can get lost in this pursuit. And yet for every funeral I've ever done and for every single hearse I've ever seen arriving at the cemetery, they've never been pulling a trailer of stuff behind. The kingdom of this world, the pursuit of pleasure, and the lack of any satisfaction. In addition to the voice of Solomon, we have the, the voice of our Savior. Number two, let's, let's look at, at, at our Savior and his idea of, of pleasure. For that, church, will you join me in the, the New Testament, the, the Gospel of Luke? Luke chapter 15, if you've got that bookmarked, wonderful. If you would turn there with me now. Jesus is going to share a story. Our Savior, Jesus, is, is also going to tell us a story about a young man who was pursuing pleasure and the purported adventures that, that pleasure offered up for him. So in Luke 15, beginning at verse 11, listen to this description. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in what church? In reckless living. So it begins with a young man disregarding his dad. His dad means nothing to him. More important to him is, is what his father possesses. And more important to him is, is the possibility of, of his father's portfolio. And so he says to his dad, I want my share. And the word that's used here, oesius, it, it talks about his share of the inheritance. He doesn't want the responsibilities of the inheritance. He doesn't want any of the responsibilities that go along with his dad's estate. He just wants the stuff. He only wants the possessions. 
And so his dad honors his request. He divides his, his property. And a few days later, we're told that the son gathered all he had, verse 13. That means he made a trip to the pawn shop. You see, it's hard to take stuff with you. And so he traded it all in and, and with a big wad of convenient cash in his hands, he made out for an address far away. Verse 13, he took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. You see, he wanted to pursue pleasure, but he didn't want anybody watching him. He didn't want any additional eyes on him. He didn't want anybody to know him because he was going to do anything and everything he could. Like Solomon, he wasn't going to deny his eyes anything. He, he squandered all of it. Diascorpizo. You want to say that with me? Diascorpizo. It means he took that wad of cash and he just scattered it. You can imagine driving down the, the Ford, and if you're traveling nice and fast, what would you do if one of your kids took all of your cash and your debit cards and everything out of your wallet and just threw it out the window? Would you be happy? Have you ever had that happen before? Talk to me later, right? It seems insane, but it's exactly what the young man did. He, he squandered, he, he scattered, he fast and furious spent it all without any conscience or, or thinking or, or consideration. And most of, the, most of the purchases were reckless experiences. As we find out later in the story, there's a whole lot of debaucherous living that's going on. Selfish momentary flings, spur of the moment pursuits, and absolutely no thought or consideration of tomorrow. Because right here, right now, this is how he felt, and right here, right now, this is the pleasure that he wanted. And he'd spend and do anything to get it. It didn't take him very long. Isn't it interesting, everything his father had worked for to amass everything his father had invested and had earned and had saved. This young man took his portion and he blew through it all in that little window. Pursuing worldly pleasure isn't cheap. And when all of the experiences and all of the parties were over, suddenly he found himself all alone. His friends were all gone. Look at verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in what church need? So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. He's bankrupt. He has squandered and scattered everything he had. And now he's begging favors from complete strangers. And yet when you 
ongoingly pursue the pleasure of the kingdom of this world, there's, there's a hard reality. When you truly find yourself in need, verse 16, no one gave him anything. Remember, Jesus is working to compare the pursuit of pleasure in the kingdom of this world with that which is most valuable in the kingdom of God. Church, would you like to know what's most valuable in the kingdom of God? Would you? The rest of you, would you? Let's, let's, let's listen to, to the rest of the story because here's the truth. In the kingdom of God, it is not about the pursuit of pleasure. In the kingdom of God, it is not about squandering and scattering and wasting. In the kingdom of God, it is not about being left alone and forgotten. In the kingdom of God, it is not about having to beg your way. In the kingdom of God, it is not about dying in your transgressions and sins. But in the kingdom of God, it is all about being pursued by your Father in heaven. It is all about having a transformative relationship through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, receiving the forgiveness of your sins and the treasure and the glory that is life everlasting in the kingdom of God before his very radiant throne above. Church, do you want the kingdom of this world or do you want the kingdom of God? Which one? Which one are we going to pursue? Because when you pursue the kingdom of God, you do not receive what you want, but you receive every single thing that you need. And as one of my brothers said before the service this morning, ask me how I'm doing. I said, how are you doing? He said, my cup over what? Overflows. Listen to the rest of the story at verse 17. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and what? And celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to what church? To celebrate. The gift of the kingdom of God is the opportunity to recognize our sin. Don't ever shy away from that. It is good for every single one of us to see our sin and to see our need. The young man did. It took him until he got to the very end of himself, but he finally did. He saw his sin and he saw the most important need in his life. And he wasn't even back into town yet. He hadn't even gotten into the village yet where everybody was talking about him and the waste that he had made of his life and the disrespect that he had had for his father. Everybody's remembering it and everybody's talking about it. And yet, you know what? His dad was looking in his direction the entire time. And he hadn't even made it back into town yet. And you know what? His dad did something so shameful. His dad gathered up his robe and his dad went racing through town. A mature, responsible father figure doesn't do that. And yet that's exactly what our father does. And he ran after and he chased after. 
And when he approached his son, his, his, his son began to, to share his confession. He couldn't even get the whole thing out because the father threw his arms around him showed him compassion and mercy and love. And you know what that young man experienced in that moment? Of all that other stuff that he thought would make him happy. In the reality of that moment, he was so overwhelmed with joy. His dad said, hurry up. Bring the best robe and put it on him. And get him a ring and put it on his finger. And I will not receive him back as a slave. I want you to go get shoes and you put those on his feet because he is one of my sons. You see, he was lost, but now he's found. And he was dead, but now he's alive. My son has come home. You see, church, the kingdom of this world has a dead end. But the kingdom of God has life and life everlasting. There is a father who is looking in the direction of every single one of us here this morning. And as Sherry shared with the children, there, there is a father who is looking in the direction of, of all these people right now who are lost in the endless pursuit of pleasure. We have the responsibility of bringing them home, of sharing with them the, the love of their Father in heaven, and knowing the greatest gift of, of Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. Church, it begins with us pursuing one kingdom alone. And then it must be the work of our lives to share that kingdom in Jesus with those who are lost right now. Church, can we do that for the glory of God? Can we? Church, can we please do that for the kingdom of God? Can we? Yes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be so. May it not just be lip service. And may we never live lives of me, myself, and I. Grateful for the reception that we've received, but thoughtless when it comes to the pending reception of those who are not yet home. Help us to continue to celebrate everything our Father in heaven has willed and done in our lives and help us to commit to bringing home, inviting home, leading home, looking for those who are still caught up in the endless pursuits of this world. Help us to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.